Good morning. How's everyone doing? We're all caffeinated and awake. Hopefully it's not too cold down here because I know it's very hot upstairs. Um, well, welcome. So uh, I actually changed the name of this uh, and I kind of had wished that I would put the name up here in the program. Maybe uh, we'd have people going dangerous automation. What do you mean by that? Um, but yes, this is dangerous automation. Um, we're going to revisit this idea of automate all the things, which uh, is a big, big idea in DevOps, as many of you probably know. Uh, so my name is Paul Reed, and uh, let's get started. So I want to do a quick survey that's going to help me. Um, and so uh, who here is a developer? Okay, and then who here is an operations person? Okay, that's pretty much most of the audience then. And uh, who here has ever automated anything? Oh, good. That's like everyone. Perfect. Okay, cool. I think we're going to have fun this morning then. All right. So I want to walk you through a bit of a quick uh, parable or situation. And while we're going through it, what I want you to do is think to yourself, because I'm going to ask you at the end, if any of the the story resonates with you in terms of something you've experienced in, in maybe one of your jobs um, or some aspect of, of the work that you've done um, and, and see how many of these, these elements of the story actually do resonate with you. See if you can keep count. So, story starts. We've got our, uh, our invoice system. It's pretty simple. Um, we were asked to build it uh, by the finance department. Um, just to do paper invoices, right? Old old standard, like send out the invoice net 30 type thing. So we build that, and it's working, and it's working very well, and we're all happy with it, and finance is happy with it. And of course, this is uh, a little bit before DevOps, maybe? So we've got uh, our dev team there on the, on the left, and of course, we've got the ops team with their, their tools uh, there on the right, responsible for running the system, keeping it going. And at some point, maybe the CFO says, hey, you know, this is giving us a lot of really good data. So let's add some reporting to it that we can use for uh, quarterly planning and reporting. And so let's, let's bolt on, uh, add some functionality to do some reporting. So we go ahead and, and add that big sort of functionality. So now it's our invoice and reporting system. And then we start ba uh, maybe deciding, well, we want to sell products uh, faster. We don't want to just support invoicing. So we add payments to it. And because we're cool, maybe we'll take Bitcoin too after a while. So we bolted that on. And now we've got the invoice reporting and payment system. All right, cool. The system seems to be working pretty well for us. Um, maybe at some point the uh, ops team says, we should really automate some of these things. So they write some scripts there to kind of automate things. But like many situations, maybe it's not automation that they have a lot of time to work on. Uh, so maybe it becomes this sort of like automated, quote unquote. And maybe some of the things are actually just run books or checklists or things like that. Uh, maybe some of the automation is floating around in different areas. So it's, it's, it's not maybe as automated as they would have liked, but they, they took a shot at it and got some stuff done. So that's cool. And then, of course, monitoring came along. So we have to add monitoring this system. So that's a, that's a whole separate other thing that we put on. Nagios is no longer enough. So now we're doing that. So now we have the automated and monitored invoice reporting and payment system. Cool. Well, let's say one of the operations persons decides, I would rather do more development. So I'm going to move over there. I'm going to join the developers over there. And I'm going to take a copy of the script that I used in operations to do a bunch of automation with me over to development. And then maybe I'm going to modify it a little bit. So I've got my own versions. And maybe I've got my own run book that I uh, didn't share with ops. Not because I, I, you know, I've got friends over there and I like them. But I, I, I was just really busy when I made those changes. And maybe I was doing my own work, so I didn't really share that with them. And then finally, maybe because of the state of affairs, there might have been a couple of little incidents or outages, but they weren't a big deal. Um, you know, we, the ops team uh, are very capable, uh, as is the dev team. So maybe there was only an outage for 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Maybe um, we lost the ability to process Bitcoin for a while, but uh, that's a small site feature not many people use, so not a big deal. So here's my question. 
in that story that I just told you, raise your hand if any aspect of what I went through sounds like any project you've ever worked on. Okay. So, I just described the 737 MAX, which, as many of you know, two aircraft went down uh, of the 737 MAX type, and um, a lot of people lost their life. So what's interesting about this case is that it's an example of a long drift into failure. So it was a long-running system with legacy requirements, and the 737 uh, was introduced in the 60s, and uh, the 737 MAX is an evolution of a plane that was released uh, and designed and released in the 60s. There are eras of modification. So what I mean by that is you've got different eras of, of the 737. You have the 737 Classic, or the, I think there's original and the Classic, and then the NG, and then the Max. So you've got a bunch of modifications being made across different eras for different requirements, right? You've got the addition of supplemental features to address changes and maintain system abstractions. This one's really interesting because the whole idea is that we're going to add automation and parts to this system specifically so that we can maintain an abstraction with other people. And we do that so they shouldn't have to know that we change anything. It should behave the same, quote unquote. Um, disconnected requirements gathering. So that's our example where maybe our ops person moved to dev and made changes without actually consulting of what ops was doing in terms of different practices and procedures that they may have had. Uh, in the 737 MAX case, what actually happened is um, they didn't uh, solicit a bunch of pilot input about this abstraction layer that they had added in there. Um, silo testing and validation, another great example of those scripts kind of forking and diverging um, and then not being tested on the other side. Um, here, the 737, the issue there was that the um, FAA actually allowed Boeing to self-certify the aircraft, which is an interesting way to handle that. Um, and then early weak stress signals were Mr. Ignored. So that's that those incidents that were kind of tiny and small and we reacted to them okay, but then it we had these massive incidents. Um, and there was actually a bunch of reports from pilots saying that aircraft acts weirdly before the two accidents. So the example that I want to give here uh, and start with is because I want to make the point that you've got this evolution and we see this in software systems all the time. Now, how many people are familiar with Knight Capital? Okay, cool. So Knight Capital uh, was a high frequency trading firm in uh, the United States. And they did a deployment on a Wednesday, and they opened up for trading on a Thursday, and they halted trading about 45 minutes into the trading day because they were getting alerts and monitors going off, and it turns out that they were losing about $170,000 a second for 45 minutes. And at the end of that 45-minute period, they had lost $460 million. Now, here's the critical aspect of that. On Friday, they were out of business because they couldn't cover the $460 million that their automation had caused them to lose. Now, the reason I bring up this case, I've talked about it before, is because there are er eerily similar aspects of the Knight Capital case and the 737 MAX. And that's actually why I wrote a blog post about, and this was a few months ago, um, and we've learned more about what happened with the MAX. But the point is, this is a case that is eerily different in aviation for a number of reasons. As, and as software professionals, we're going to want to pay attention to how this plays out because it is still playing out. And there's a number of factors that are actually interesting around automation, perhaps dangerous automation, that is going to affect us in terms of how we want to think about this problem moving forward. We're going to, need to be talking about that, more of that today. So. This is me, this is the About Me slide that everyone has. I'm not gonna go through it except to say I'm on Twitter, so you can follow me there if you want to say various things. Um, and the other, other thing that I'll mention is um, uh, we're gonna be talking a lot about human factors and system safety today. So that's where a lot of these examples are actually coming from. And a lot of the research that's been done on that, we're gonna be kind of talking about how that applies to us as technology professionals. All right, so who's seen this? Like we're doing DevOps, okay? Automate all the things. Literally all of the things. Um, I'm searching XKCD, so great. Um, the, this is the universal install, install script, right? So you can automate all your installations in one easy to run script, right? Um, but it's worth noting 
Um, when we talk about automation, a lot of times, like, what do we mean by that? Automation, I think, is one of those words specifically in DevOps that we throw around a lot, and it's worth actually slowing down to consider what do we mean? Do we mean a script? Do we mean chef and puppet? Do we mean something else entirely? So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Because I think it's going to frame our discussion when we talk about where the boundaries can be, where automation could become quote unquote dangerous. So of course you've got this sort of spectrum, right? And we might start on the spectrum with like a single script, right? That's one, one end of the spectrum that automates a set of tasks. Maybe somewhere else on the spectrum we've got this idea of orchestration. So that's some tool that maybe does things at scale for us. And we may not know how the algorithms entirely work, but we know that, for instance, Chef and Puppet have some guarantees about how they're supposed to work. So if we plug our modules into how they work, then theoretically should be okay. We're seeing a lot of interest in machine learning and AI around actually automation. There's, this is a big interest in the incident response space because there's a thinking, well, wait, wait a minute, if we can look for all the patterns and the incidents that we've had, could we predict incidents that we might have? That would, would be interesting and useful. Um, so that could be a form of automation, right? And, um, but you might ask yourself too, uh, do run books? Maybe if they're not scripted, maybe we haven't had time to script them, but we have had time to write them down. There's some run books that you can actually are interactive run books, which is kind of interesting. Do those count as automation? Here's another interesting question. With that script, is it automation when it's written or does it only become automation when somebody else other than the person who wrote it runs it? So in other words, if I write it and I know what the steps are, does it take on this magic of automation when somebody else who doesn't have the context that I had when I wrote it? Is that when, when it becomes automation? So one of the interesting things about this is this is sort of one spectrum, right? But if you look at our systems today and we talk about them being quote unquote automated, there's layers of automation that we have to deal with, right? On the development side, I mean, in some sense is a compiler automation. I mean, it's, it's taking stuff that we used to do with punch cards, doing it for us. So we've got at least some level of automation up at the dev side. And of course, on operations, that's again a big deal. We want to we wanna automate as much as the operations task as we can. So what we found is we're in a world where we've got this layered automation. Now, I have a quick question um, about some of this automation. We're going to look at how we layer it, but it's funny. This is, uh, should we send a notification? So this is a flow chart that somebody did for Slack. So you would think that sl the Slack flow chart has what? How many steps for should we send a notification to a user? Guess. 30? 400. Well, I thought it was actually more like maybe eight, eight to 10, something like that. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, so there's a little bit of complexity going on there. And this is just for Slack, just for Slack trying to decide whether or not it should buzz your phone, right? Okay, well, a lot of us use Slack, right? So if we have some system, and this is some random diagram of actually some random system that I got off the internet, just Googled for it. We might connect that to Slack somehow so that it can report and tell us something about that. So there's a layer of connected automation. This is um, a new relics architecture, so we might, to do monitoring, we might add that to our application. Of course, then we want maybe notifications to go to Slack, uh, which is a plugin to do. People are adding PagerDuty Victor Ops, right? And so suddenly, this complexity that we've seen for Slack, all of these systems have that, and we're tying them all together in addition to just the automation that we're doing for our own system. And yet we rely on this other stuff to tell us when our automation might be broken or maybe when our, not our automation, but our system is broken. So at least for me, this raises a lot of interesting questions about how we wrangle this complexity and how we deal and think about this interconnected automation. So it, for me at least, raises the question, should we automate all the things? So one of the big, things that has been bandied about in the research space for quite a while now is this idea uh, of the ironies of automation. So uh, some of the first thinking about this happened quite a while ago, and I want to point out this, this is from 1983. So they've been thinking about this problem 
in the research area for a long time. Now, the thing that I'll point out that's interesting when we talk about this is the problem they were concerned with in the 80s with automation was control automation for things like nuclear power plants. Because if you think about 1983, what big problem had just happened? Three Mile Island. And what big problem was about to happen? Chernobyl, yeah. So they were trying to think about, okay, we've got chemical plants, we've got nuclear plants, we have a big problem. What are the ironies of that kind of automation? Um, there's a great line. This paper suggests that the increased interest in human factors among engineers reflects the irony that the more advanced the control system is, the more crucial may be the contribution of the human operator. They were saying this back in the 80s. All right, so let's dig into this a little bit. So what did uh, Bainbridge, what did she say were some of these ironies of automation? So she pointed out, okay, well, if, if you've got an automated system, your manual skills for dealing, if you've got an automated system that is managing some process for you, uh, and you w w used to do this manually, if you don't use those manual skills, they're going to deteriorate. So that's kind of interesting and perhaps ironic because then how do you wrangle the automation if it goes wrong? The generation of what she called new strategies when you're dealing with a problem requires an adequate knowledge of the system, but sometimes the automation can do weird things. Now, before we talk about that, she also pointed out something interesting, and I, th I think this should resonate with tech people a lot, because she said there's some concern that the present generation of automated systems, which are mo monitored and designed and created by people that uh, used to have the manual skills, what happens when we have the next generation of engineers that don't have those skills? So what happens in your organization when senior engineers maybe write a bunch of automation and then it gets handed down and, and you're running some script that was written five years ago. This is an example of that weird irony. And I think she's pointing out an interesting point. She says, you can't be, they, we can't expect those engineers to know what to do. And yet, what do we do if they make a mistake? We ask, well, why didn't you know that? Or, or why, um, what, what led you to not knowing that? And, yet, and so, in a weird way, we do expect that of them. Um, automation generally requires a speed versus correctness trade-off. So what she was pointing out here is if you automate some task with a computer, one of the reasons you might want to do that is so that it's faster, right? And yet, when humans look at a system that's doing some automation, basically we're trading off speed for correctness because humans, if, if the computer's operating faster, which it is, we can't actually assert that what the automation is doing is correct. We can only assert that it's acceptable, which is not the same as correct. And so there's this weird irony that because we want to go faster, we actually make the trade-off of speed for correctness because we can't prove it anymore because we've uh, taken that speed upgrade, as it were. She pointed out that automation can camouflage current system state. So what she was trying to say is, have you ever had an uh, auto scaling group or something like that where um, you, know, you, you deploy an image or something and it scales up and you basically find that the auto scaling group, there's some bug that's causing a problem uh, in the software and the auto scaling responds by scaling up more because that's what you told it to do. Now the problem with that and what she's getting at is that if you've got an automation that says I can handle this range of possibilities, it's gonna camouflage that you have a systems problem until it gets to the edge where it can't actually control those things anymore and then it's gonna break very badly. And so you might wanna have known, hey, this bad code push caused a, a load problem on our servers here, but the automation scaled up the number of instances until it was here, and then you have a much bigger problem on your hands. Um, I love that this quote is in there, in that paper. Uh, Automatic systems should fail, obviously, which I think we all can agree um, that would be nice uh, if they did. Um, but she's noting, I think, calling out that at that time, and maybe even now, we sort of assume that, but we don't really design necessarily for them to fail, obviously. She also pointed out that tracing the decision trees made by algorithms can be difficult or impossible. And this is really relevant when we talk about ML AI systems that are trying to uh, reason about highly scaled cloud-based, you know, with Kubernetes and we've got a bunch of containers running around. 
if we spackle some AI or some ML on that and we enter into the system because of a problem, it can be very difficult with those technologies to, figure, to ask the, the machine learning component, how did, how did you actually get to that decision point? And that's relevant because if we get paged, there's no one to talk to to say, how do we get here? There's literally not a record that we can look at to see how we got there. In terms of we may be able to look at the effects, but not how the decision was made. And we can even see this, you don't have to have MLAI, we can even see this in complex automation um, interconnectedness and interactions where there was some interaction that happened that we didn't design for and we can't replicate it. And so we can see that we don't need fancy AI to see this. So this leads to a lot of situations. Have any of you ever joined an incident or even not joined an incident? You just, that seems wonky to me and said any of these things. I particularly like the stop interrupting me while I'm busy. <laughs> um, these quotes, by the way, uh, are from a research paper. And what's interesting about this paper, these are all uh, quotes from either pilots or surgeons. So they've been dealing with this problem for quite a while. And it's, it's interesting to think, you know, uh, why did it do this if you're at 35,000 feet? I don't know if you're in the back of the plane, you want to hear the pilot saying, why did it do this? That might not be what you want. There's a last little bit that I think is, is very relevant when we talk about automation and we talk about, oh, you know, uh, maybe if we automate things, there's you know, this fear that if we automate things, people will lose their jobs. And this talk isn't about that. But what's interesting about this is she has this little tongue in cheek comment where she's like, it is ironic to train operators to follow instructions. In other words, just run the run book and yet put them in the system so that when that doesn't work, we can provide that those people can provide intelligence to it. And this is probably the single most best argument against this idea that automation allows us to fire people. That may be the case, but uh, in the short term, but at some point you get to, well, you can just fire all the intelligence away and you're left with automation that uh, is only as smart as the original designers. Some other really problematic uh, automation, aspects of automation. So uh, automation is often treated uh, as disconnected or distinct from the application that it's supporting, or maybe the, the, in, the infrastructure layer that it's supporting. Um, and that can be diff uh, problematic for a lot of reasons, um, one of which being that uh, the, if it's not thought of as part of that system, it doesn't co-evolve with the system, which is that next point. Um, we should be treating automation like a product. And there's a big push in DevOps to move from project-based work, and it's, it changes a bunch of things. It changes how we fund projects, how we do that work, how we think about the problem, to more project or uh, product-based work, where the product, like your CI/CD pipeline, has a roadmap, it has features. You may have, your customers may be all internal. Um, but this idea that we think of it as a product that evolves with the rest of the product, and that's how we need to think about automation as well. Finally, um, teams can oddly devalue the implementation or ownership of automation. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, um, oh, we need to automate that, so let the intern do it. Um, my first job out of college, uh, I was doing a bunch of build and automation work, and uh, I, had to, I had to write an installer. And I went, I went to a senior engineer and I asked him, I said, hey, uh, so can I get a code review? It's related to the installer thing. And he went on like a five minute tirade about, oh yeah, people who write installers are always the weakest coders and they're always the, you know, the, the worst and they, we, we always give it to the interns. And, and then I pointed out my code reviewers for the installer. And he was like, oh. Um, I've always found that interesting. And especially so that our automation is getting more complex. You're basically saying, hey, the person with the least amount of knowledge about how we all do our daily work, why don't you go automate something? And that's a big ask, I think. Um, I took this picture. I don't know if, I, was Ron Popeil over in Europe? Did he sell his rotisserie chicken makers here? Um, his big thing was set it and forget it. And I think that's, that embodies this. We have this idea that if we develop the automation, we can just set it and forget it. And it'll work. And uh, 
I don't, I don't know that that's actually real. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, joint cognitive systems for a second. Um, because it's a it's a fascinating concept, and and a lot of the thing, a lot of the statements that I'm going to make, like if I I, I said to you, uh, automation is dangerous, it's hard to understand the context for that unless we talk about this. So we're going to talk about this for a little bit. Um, the, the point here is um, talking about the aspects of actors in a system. So this is pretty, e you know, if you think about it, I'm talking about humans. Most of us have autonomy in a system, uh, and so if we're, let's say we're working an incident, and maybe it's a low priority incident, it's not like a big deal, but something's weird and we're working with our team members, maybe there's three or four or five of us doing that. So we all have autonomy, right? We all are able to impact the system uh, in our own way, so that's, we have that. We have some level of authority. Um, at the very least, we are still able to do things on our own, even if it's, quote unquote, the wrong thing or against the policy. So in that regard, we have some sense of authority. Um, we have directed attention. So this is the thing that we're paying attention to. We have that ability as people. Um, redirectability. So that's if I go up to someone, hey, can, I need you to help me look at this thing. I've just redirected your attention. So we have that ability and that capability. And also, we have, to varying degrees, interpredictability. And this is interesting because it's not just predictability, it's interpredictability between agents. And so really, really good teams, really tight teams, one of the aspects that they have is their behaviors are interpredictable. And actually, more than that, they're, when um, they, let's say we're working on a problem and you do something that's weird to me, they're really good at saying, I didn't expect you to do that. Can you explain to me why you did that? And we can repair our ability to be interpredictable in the situation, in the moment, to continue debugging the problem. That is critical to what we're going to be talking about. And again, that's what makes really good, especially operations teams, um, and especially in an incident context, um, able to do their work so effectively. So these are operators. These are people. We all have these things. Let's look at automation. Well, so with a lot of the systems that we're building, uh, has anyone ever had this problem where they're working some incident or something like that and some cron job fires and then the script starts running and doing its thing? Well, clearly it's autonomous because it just did the thing and it has some authority because it's screwing your day up. So check on those. Do scripts or automation have directed attention? Well, it's an interesting philosophical question. I would probably argue not, at least in the way that we think about it. They have a form of directionality. They have a thing that they can operate on, but you, you can't get their attention. So they don't, they don't really have that. And of course, if they don't have directed attention, you can't redirect their attention. So they don't have that. And I don't know how you would argue with a script that's misbehaving. I mean, I've tried. It's not very satisfying. So it doesn't have that. All right. So here's the problem, though. In complex socio-technical systems, where we're talking about people and technology, this is where all the coordination happens. These skills with other people, that's where the coordination happens. And that's where technology lets us down in this regard, specifically automation. It doesn't have the ability to do those things. There's a great quote, I love this, technologists, us, often mistake connectivity, the capability to connect disparate parties and data sources for coordination. Automation might allow us to connect things, but it doesn't allow us to coordinate with the agent in the system. And the, so the point, the whole point of joint cognitive system, and the reason I bring it up, is that because uh, to say that our automation is an agent an independent agent that we have to deal with in these systems, and that's why it's, it's difficult. Now, uh, I want to go through the animacy paradox because it's, it's a, a, a fascinating side note to this that, again, we'll, we'll come back to and, and why the, all of this becomes really hard. So automated systems, as they get more autonomy and authority, which we talked about, they have two kinds of interpretation, and I guarantee that every single one of you has experienced both, you've, you've interpreted it in both kinds of ways. As a deterministic machine, so we look at the automation, we say, I know what it did, 
I, I can see, I, re, I can read the instructions, I can look at the logs, I can figure out what that is. And also, as an animate agent capable of activities of ind independent of the operator. Now, you might ask yourself, okay, well, what's the difference between these two things? And this is why, if you're an operations person or a developer that has been on call or, or whatever, I, I'm going to guess that you've experienced this. In hindsight, we can see it as a deterministic machine. When the incident is over and we can sit down and, and look at everything, we can go, oh, I, I get how the script ran here and cron got kicked off there and the auto scaling did this. And so we can say, oh, it's a, I get it. It's, I could draw it out in some sort of flow chart. But in the moment, that thing that makes us go, what, what is it doing now and what is it going to do next? That's in context. And in context of a particular incident or action or whatever happens to be going on, that's where these things are not deterministic to us. Now, what it's interesting to ask, what makes this shift for us? It's usually in the context of an incident. It's usually in the moment. We're kind of like, what is going on? And after it, we can go, oh. Now, where this becomes problematic is when you are the person that experienced it as an independent agent because you were fighting with it. And everyone else is like, it's a deterministic machine. And the point that I actually want to make, because I want to double down on this point, the point that I will make is what happened with the 737 MAX pilots? We all said, the 737 is a deterministic machine. You made a mistake. You need better pilot training. And yet, now that we have more information, we can see that in context, those pilots had no idea what was going on because they had an agent, the MCAS system, running around the aircraft telling it to do something that they didn't know existed. They didn't know that agent existed. Okay. I want to do a quick digression on the Rasmussen Triangle. If you've seen a talk from me before, you've probably heard this, but I'm going to go through it because I think this model is really important. It's also going to be useful here uh, for our discussion. So um, Rasmussen, by the way, he was a human factors researcher. He uh, cut his teeth on Three Mile Island. He did a ton of research there. And then, of course, um, he actually just passed away at this year, I think. So he has contributed a huge body of work. Um, and this it's interesting. This has held up incredibly well. This model is like from... I want to say the late or early 90s. Anyway, in his triangle, he had this idea that there's uh, over here the boundary of economic failure, boundary of unacceptable workload, and the boundary of uh, ac uh, acceptable risk or acceptable performance. And so basically this idea is that if we're a system and we're around in the middle of this triangle kind of bouncing around, um, we wouldn't cross the economic failure boundary because that means it's too expensive. So if we had some coding project that we're working on, if it crossed this failure boundary, we wouldn't do it because it would cost the business too much. Or it would be too expensive for anybody to buy, so we wouldn't build it, right? On the unacceptable workload boundary, that's the idea that humans are um, lazy at heart. Um, and I don't mean that as an insult. I mean that from an evolution standpoint. Our brains are always looking for shortcuts to save us uh, grams of sugar that we burn in our brain for our neurons. So we're always trying to find ways to make work more efficient. So uh, if we ask somebody to do a task that takes 18,000 steps, you're going to say, I'm not going to do that. And that's this boundary that you've crossed. And then finally, we've got acceptable risk, acceptable performance. And that boundary is when things go boom and potentially big boom ways. Okay, so we've got this model. We're in the middle. We're in the system somewhere, bouncing around. Um, and they, they had this idea called, the uh, Rasmussen had this idea called pressure gradients. So this idea, cheaper, better, faster. So basically, you've got sort of the business pushing away from this boundary. And then you've got us pushing away from this boundary. And you got to ask yourself, where are we all pushing this system? What boundary? Okay, that's interesting. In the original model, uh, Rasmussen added this idea that all of these boundaries are changing because our system is constantly changing. So the idea was that there's also this dotted line. And, and the point here that um, has been made uh, before is, uh, 
another researcher called this the discretionary space. So his idea was basically um, that there's this space that us as actors can explore. It's, it's our discretion on how to operate the system. Now, the point that I want to make is organizations like Netflix and Google and Amazon and all these unicorns, we often think they don't have outages, and they do. The thing that makes them seem special and weird and magical and what have you is that they are really, really good at exploring this discretionary space, and they're really good at figuring out when that system is in the dotted line zone. And if that system actually goes over the edge, they're good at wrestling it back across into the discretionary space. So again, it's not that they don't have these incidents. They have them all day long. They're just so good at it, you don't as customers or we don't as customers notice it. And that's the major difference. Now, why does this matter with automation? If you said to yourself, hey, I want to be as good as Netflix and Google, so I'm going to put together um, ways for us to explore the discretionary space, and there are techniques you can use to do that, to have your team do that together. But here's the problem. Automation can't deal with the discretionary space. It can't explore it with you. It, it's incapable of, of dealing with this at all. And that's why when you automate something, you should think about it in the context of where your system might be in this triangle and how close it is to the edge. And there's, there's this concept of brittleness. Automation tends to get brittle at the edges. What happens, and, and this explains actually why it gets brittle at the edge, because it, it actually can't deal with this. And the thing that we went over with joint cognitive systems, it makes it even worse. Because there's not only can it not deal with it, it, it can't actually tell us it can't deal with it. It's uh, not capable of, of uh, doing that. So, am I saying just stop automating anything? No, I'm not saying that. So we're going to talk about some things uh, that we can use to sort of tackle this problem. Have people heard of the checklist manifesto? Yes? Okay. The checklist manifesto is a very interesting book. It was written by a surgeon. Uh, and there's a quote here that talks about healthcare. Uh, I thought it was interesting that the thing they struggle with is how to make all of these things fit together. So doctors, drugs, devices, specialists, how to, and, and that's what we're preoccupied with. That's our problem is how do we make all this stuff fit together? One of the things I find very interesting about this book is when I read it, um, and he looks at a bunch of different types of checklists. So uh, healthcare checklists and um, aviation checklists and construction checklists. Um, so what's interesting to me about this is there, he spends a, a notable section of the book basically explaining uh, that surgeons aren't as great as they think they are. And so there's a bit of hubris in medicine around this. And he would show it, he would have a checklist and, and he would show all the mistakes. There are things like surgeons literally would not wash their hands sometimes. And it's because they got distracted or something happened, but they didn't have a checklist next to them to remind them. And so what's interesting to me is that there was a, like a third of the book just trying to explain that, no, you're actually not as good as you think you are, which I just found interesting, especially, you know, now I'm like, I don't ever want to go to the hospital. Um, so the point that I do want to make um, about this is I am not talking about this kind of checklist where it's kind of like, oh, there's kind of these items with little check marks. Um, I'm also, this is an aviation checklist. Um, I'm not actually talking uh, um, about this either. And by the way, this is my aviation checklist. I actually left my flight plan open once. So I had to modify my checklist because they sent out search and rescue and I was sitting at home. Uh, that was embarrassing. Um, I am talking about this. And this is a, a technical checklist that uh, I designed and, and worked with um, some people on. And it's got a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, but I want to point out two things that I think are really important, two aspects of it. It has uh, a person who's responsible for executing the task, and then it also has a different person who is responsible for verifying that the task is completed uh, as described. Now, what's interesting about that is you might think, oh, well, we're all, we only do that so people can cross-check, and that's true. But when you actually have a checklist that you've designed like this and put it in front of two people, I can't tell you how often you'll see somebody go to verify something and they'll say, I'm A, I'm surprised you did what you did that way, and B, you, the way that you did it means that when I do it, I also account for this and this and this, and you didn't. 
So it's actually more than just verifying the state. It's actually a way for these two people to communicate about how they go about the task and to validate the actions they took, but also the state that the system is in. And that's actually what this known deviations observations kind of column is for, um, to collect that sort of feedback. Now, what's interesting about this is you might say, okay, wait, so you want me to just take all of my automated processes and put them into a paper checklist, and every time I have to run that, I have to have two people. Okay, you're insane, and I'm going to leave for lunch. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying, though, is this is a really good way to capture some of that joint cognitive system behavior that's going on when people are doing work. And the reason that you would do this is you basically, uh, when I've done this with teams, what we do is we write up what we think the process is, and then we use the checklist and do it manually until the checklist stops changing. Depending on how often we do that process, it can take six months for it to stop changing. It can take two weeks. It can take a couple days if they do it really often, right? But the point is, when it's done, when it's done changing, that's our requirements specification for actually writing what the automation looks like. And this is another XK CD cartoon, right, where we think, oh, I'll just write some automation for this, right? So I'll write the code, and then I'll debug it, and, and then suddenly I'm now just working on automation, and I'm not actually, not actually doing my original task anymore. This is a way to cope with that. I know this is a weird suggestion, but it's, um, it's worth talking about. Version control can actually help with these things. Now, uh, the reason I call this out is because... Um, this was from the 2016 State of DevOps report that said application code and app and system configuration are all in version control. And so they started n noticing in the research th in 2014 that putting your stuff in version control had a huge impact on, on organizations' ability to not only deliver, but remediate, deliver software, but remediate problems with it. Now, the reason I bring this up, I think most people are on like the, okay, version control, good train, that's cool. I still run into ops teams that are like, oh yeah, we have that script that's on so-and-so's desk in, or in so-and-so's shared home directory, and we kind of run it, and it's fine. It works, but nobody thought to put it into Git. Okay, cool. Maybe you're past that and you've convinced whoever to get their stuff into Git, but the one thing that I'll actually point out, who here uses Jenkins? It's interesting how many people put their entire build process into this little window of 50 lines, is this version controlled? No, it is not version controlled. And here's the thing, we are forgetting this lesson because if you look, have everyone, anyone heard of the low code movement? So low code is the ability, and so the reason I bring it up, Slack announced a low code environment. And so it's basically a way for us to script workflows and things and you don't have to be a developer. You can use GUI tools and you can kind of write a couple lines of code and it, it's low code. Now, I can tell you I worked with a client that um, did very, very complex orchestration with VMware using their GUI VM something whatever tool. And that thing was not under version control, and that thing was unmaintainable. One of the first things we had to do is rip all of that out. So the point is, you may hear, oh, version control, yeah, I got that, we're doing that. But there's these weird stuff, configuration leaks in weird ways. Uh, and we need to think about that because if you think about it from a build process, that's, that's automation, right? And if something goes wrong, one of the tools that we're going to use to figure it out, what happened is the history of what changes were made and why. And that's one of the biggest uses of it. Okay. So uh, dealing with the ironies, this was Bainbridge talking about, okay, and it's funny, in that paper, she doesn't talk about solutions. She actually talks about things we should think about, like areas for solutions. So she made a really big deal about uh, the, the aspect of time. And so this ability of teams to buy time in an incident. So uh, think of like firefighters, things that they may do when they roll up at the scene first very quickly that gives them more time to, to assess the situation or deal with what's happening. It's the idea of buying time. So simulation, chaos engineering, game days, these are ways to give your teams the ability to buy time. And there's a lot of good talks and content on how to run those, so we're not going to talk about that. But simulation is, is important. And this goes back to that irony about when we have a lot of automation, our skills might actually atrophy in dealing with the system. 
Um, and then, of course, widen, widening our system understanding. Um, and this is one of those, um, you know, if you look at retrospectives, one of the biggest values that you can get out of it is if you find someone that says, oh, and you'll see it in a retro, they'll say, I didn't know it worked that way. And we all have that. We've all, you know, the database team does their thing. And we think we know how the database works, and they come in and they go, well, actually, it works this way. Or it used to work that way, but now it works this way. And so if we engage in activities that constantly push our, um, allow us to push our understanding of the system, that will give us the ability to buy time in situations where the automation might have gone awry or caused problems for us. This idea of checks over locks. So this is the idea that when you design locks into the system, um, you actually want to be very careful. You actually want to design them as checks. And the reason for that is you want to assert the state of the system, not how you get there. Because if you're in a situation where um, you're having to deal with a problem, you don't want to constrain your team's ability to come up with the solution. Like you don't want to second guess their strategy for getting from point A to point B. You just want to be able to assert that that they are in the state of point B. Now, the interesting thing to me about this, do you know what this is a reference to in our space? This is all of uh, when you have regulated industries and you have to do an emergency change request. And of course, the paperwork for that is, is just like, well, you know, a few sentences. And if it's a regular change, it's like a notebook of, of stuff, right? And so, again, regulatory stuff is a whole other topic. But this is a nod to that, that in situations, you need to have an ability to um, give your team the tools to get where they need to go without second guessing their strategy to get there. And then finally, and this is kind of an overarching point, consider the element of time pressures when designing automation. There's certain automation where there is no time pressure, right? I've got, uh, as a dumb example, I've got a little script that will tell me if my mail spool has gotten mail and if it has, it shows me the subject lines of the mail that I got, but just the new mail. That's not timing critical automation. Um, the deployment link between my pipeline and Amazon or wherever I'm deploying it, that's probably timing critical because there's a lot going on there and there's a lot of reasons that we would want to use that in, a, in an incident or a fix it context. So we might want to think about that automation a little differently than maybe even maybe a backup script, although maybe not. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about framing automation coherently. So uh, this is uh, an appeal um, that I think when we think about automation as scripts, it's worth actually uh, investigating frameworks that force us to look, sort of unify the way we do automation. I think there's value in that. And so when we look at Chef and Puppet and Ansible, that's great. And it's an example of basically they give us some guarantees. And when we talk about automating things, we can put the things that we want it to do, and it, it has a space of things that it can do, into that automation. Now, if people have gone through the transformation with Puppet or Chef, I know there's an ability that you, and, and a lot of people to just get there will do this. They'll put, they'll wrap a shell script in the Chef, you know, framework. And that, that's cool, that'll get you there, but the problem with that is we're kind of adding a layer of indirection. So if you cannot do that, that's, that's certainly good. Um, I'm not going to talk a ton about quick release, but it's, it's a framework that, um, that I wrote uh, for a while. And there's, Mozilla has a, a version of it that was based on the same ideas because I actually worked there when we came up with this. But the idea here is that um, this automation framework makes you explicitly state what the steps are to do the thing what the state of the system would be. So, so in the simple case, if I copy a file from point A to point B, the verification is that the file in uh, uh, point B looks like the file in point A and is completely copied and all of that kind of stuff, right? So it separates out those steps. It allows you to rerun a single step. So if it fails because a network share is down, well, you're not going to encode mount the network share into this necessarily, but you can mount the network share and then start the automation process up at the last execute step that failed. You can also run it in verify mode, where it'll just basically verify all the steps are, are done. And then it logs things, so then you can um, look at stuff. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that, that separation between execution and verify actually comes from this idea of having kind of two independent uh, actors doing that task. 
Uh, and then rerun. Um, I, I see Damon's in a room. I was talking to him about rerun last night. Rerun is basically quick release. Quick release is Python. Uh, rerun is ba uh, quick release in Bash. Um, and I actually, again, I think it's a really cool idea. It's, it's, it, it seems cool to me that uh, there's a framework that you can basically put this stuff into. And then uh, if it breaks, you actually have a, a place to know where to start debugging. And you know, unlike a 4,000 line shell script, which I've dealt with, you know where it broke and what state it left uh, things in. So uh, that's uh, from the GitHub page. So I, I want to talk a little bit, uh, finishing up really, about uh, improving the coordination. So we, we talked about this, that this is, this is the problem in a joint cognitive system. This is where all the coordination takes place and this is why it's hard for automation. So I want to talk a little bit about if we change, I'll go back actually, if we change directed attention, redirectability, and interpredictability, what would that mean if we could make automation be that way? What, how would we do that? Well, limited span of control, if we limit uh, the ability of automation of the things that it can touch so that we put more things in discrete sort of paths, then we know what, what directed attention it has. They're, basically, their field of attention is more narrow, which al allows us to, to um, reason easier about what it has done and what it can do. Um, decomposable stop start, so that's the thing I was talking about with those frameworks that actually allow you to have an automation process that might be 400 steps, and if it breaks at step 250, you know it broke at step 250, and then you can go fix it or start it at step 250. So being able to decompose things sort of allows you to redirect what the automation in its entirety from point A to point B, you can split it into sub points if things go wrong. Inner predictability is a big one. Uh, I, I don't know. You, like I said, it's hard to argue with the script. One of the things I'll add is retrospective audit. And operators, you can do this. And in retro, you'll ask, okay, walk me through why you made the decision you made. And if you have a really good generative culture, you'll get an answer and you'll be able to do something with that. Maybe change a runbook or change automation or change monitoring or whatever it is. Um, making your automation more retrospectively auditable is a big thing. So that's, this is where it's hard for AI and ML to do this unless you can get like a trace of all the decisions it made. Um, but this is really important because it allows you in, in the past, and I don't mean just a log file, I mean richer data around, around that. So wrapping up, we can keep automating things, yes. Please do. Um, automation isn't dangerous usually, but I do want to make the point the way that our industry thinks about it right now can be. And I see this most often in, in when people sort of dismissively say, oh, let's automate that, or let's have the intern automate that. And that's not against interns. It's I think you're not understanding how complex all of the work that you do is, and so asking someone with less experience in that system to do it may not actually be the right choice. Automation must be designed. You have to actually design this automation, and more importantly, that is a team sport. So if you're writing a script for your team and you didn't talk to anybody else on your team about what they do when they do that task, your automation will be brittle, and you're probably in for sad times. Automation should be treated like a product with an owner, which by definition means if you didn't talk to anyone, then um, it, it, uh, you don't have customers. And so the product owner is sort of weird and misunderstood. If you can't identify those roles, that's something you should probably think about. And automation that actually truly participates in our cognitive joint systems is still nascent. And I don't have a good solution for you. I just want you to be aware of it. So that when somebody like me comes and says, hey, automation can be dangerous, you have a context for why maybe that could be kind of true. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in the work that we do. And us as professionals that it's hard to, uh, we don't necessarily think about day to day. Um, and so there's a bunch of weirdos in the human factor space who do think about this um, because we're watching the hard work that you do and all of this inner predictability stuff. And so we should think about that when we write this stuff. So go forth and automate.
Thanks.